For starters, in chapter 12, God tells Abraham, hey, I want you to leave behind the country where you were born. I want you to leave behind the inheritance that's there waiting for you. And go to the land that, I, that I, I'll, I'll tell you when you get there. That's scary. And as he's on this journey, as he's, as he's following God, he, his nephew, Lot, gets captured by this group of kings. So Abram gets a bunch of people together, about 300 men, and he has to go and rescue Lot from these kings. So not only does he have a reason to be afraid because he's in a new place, but he's also afraid now because he's upset leaders in the area that might be coming after him seeking revenge. Those are just two reasons. There, there's, a, there's a third reason that Abram's afraid. We'll get to that one in a few moments. But, but Abram is afraid. So the very first thing that God says to him, and the word that he brings, is he, said, he tells Abram, do not be afraid. God's going to go on. He's going to tell Abram, he says, do not be afraid, for I am your shield. Why would Abram be a shield? I mean, he's living his life for God. He's following God where God's telling him to go. Why would he be a shield? Because God's telling him that there is going to be battles in this life that he is living in the faith. You realize that's why Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that we are to take up the shield of faith? He's not telling you to take up the shield because it looks pretty. He's telling you to take up the shield because stuff's going to start flying at you. But in this case, if God comes to him and says, don't be afraid, and Abram, I am your shield. And when God's telling Abram that he's a shield, he's, you know, what, what, what does a shield do? A shield protects the person that wields it, right? You can use it to block a blow from the enemy. You can use it to, to block flying projectiles. You might, you, know, you might be hitting the legs or the arm or something. But it's basically hitting the arm or the leg. Most times you can survive that way. Just don't hope I'm not your medic. Ask Nicole about my hand. It's not good. Drink some water and walk it off. But when you use a shield, when the person wielding the shield uses it, not only are they protected, but after the battle's over, you know what the reward of battle is if you wield the shield correctly? The reward is you're still alive. You can keep fighting, you live to fight another day. And so when God is telling Abram that, hey, I will be your shield, he's like, he's telling Abram, I will protect you so you can live to fight another day. <coughs> God's telling Abram in the midst of battle, you can have hope. You can have hope that there is going to be a tomorrow because I, God, am your shield. <coughs> He's telling Abram, you can be courageous in the moment of battle. Because I, God, am your shield. You know, the shields we make as human beings, they, they can break, right? I, 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 you know, if you're using a trash can lid, it's a balloon bubble, it's going to get smashed up. The wooden ones, they shatter. Metal can be bent. But if God is your shield, almighty and all-powerful, well, there's nothing that can harm you. Nothing that's going to deem God up. So Abraham, Abraham can take courage and fight in the day in the day of battle because he has God as his shield. And he can have faith. He can have faith that, that God is going, he's going to be able to come through the other side because God is his shield. God is protecting him. So that's what God is in his first opening statement to Abraham in the section. He's saying, don't be afraid. I am your shield. The verses two and three speaks. God opens opens up with this beautiful word, with these beautiful words to Abram. And verses two and three, Abram comes back up. Here, but here's my problem, God. This is the problem that I have. You're saying these wonderful things, but this is the problem that I have. You see, when you call me to leave my my father's house behind and, and go to this land that you tell me I know when I got there, you said you would make me into a father of many nations. I 
God, here I am. I've been obedient to you. I've followed you. But look, I don't have any kids. Look around, the house is empty. Remember I told you I mentioned later another fear that Abram had. Abram's fear is that he with all this stuff that he gets, he's a man of power, he's a man of wealth at, the, at this time period because of God's blessings upon him. But Abram's fear is that he would have no one to pass it to. And not only that, not only if he didn't have someone to pass it to, you know, then what would happen with these things? But who's going to take care of him and his wife when they get older? Now, the, the law and the custom of that time allowed for, for, for men like Abram to, to pass their belongings on to a servant, and that servant could also therefore take care of, kind of take the place of a, a child if they didn't have one. But let's be honest. Family is different than a higher income. Try and count them. 
That's, that's what it says, right? It says, try and count them. See if you can. Try and count them. Because that's how many descendants you're going to have. So Abram was, was sucked up into his problem. And he was, looking, he was dust looking at dust. And what does God do? God takes Abram outside and takes his focus off the dust and lifts him up to the sky and tells him, count the stars. God readjusted Abram's sight so he wasn't looking down, but he was looking up. Verse 6 tells us this. It says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him his righteousness. Abram believed God. And that word believed here, uh, in the original language, it, it literally means to to um, Yeah, that original word literally means to prop or, or, or to stay put. It means that, that whatever you're going to build on is a firm and solid foundation. It's going to be something that's immovable and sturdy. And so what that word believe is, is, is implying is that Abram is going to take this promise of God. He is going to build his entire life, his entire existence off this promise that God has given him. Though the reality of the situation around him is saying something different, he's going to take God's promise and he's going to trust God with what he says. He's going to build his entire life on it. For Abram, there's nothing, there's nothing but God and God's plan. And then they, and it, it, there was a moment where he doubted, where he was unsure of of what was going to happen, all he had to do was take on a minute stop and look up the stars and count them again. Because that's what God promised him. Aaron trusted the one who made the promise. And this idea of that where it says, and it was credited to Abram's righteousness. This is, this is what the New Testament writers read and they just latched onto it. Paul's going to write about it in Romans 4. James is going to talk about it in chapter 2 of his epistle. That God took Abraham's faith and credited it to him as righteousness. That's saying that it wasn't based on what Abram did. It wasn't about Abram leaving his house. It wasn't about Abram building anything. It wasn't about him amassing wealth. It was about Abram believing God and trusting him enough to build his life upon what God said. It was his faith, not works, that was created to Abraham. Abram is with righteousness. So what does this have to do with you and I? And while certainly this passage does have a, a bloodline lineage attached to it, we all know if you continue reading in Genesis that Abram's going to have a son that's named Isaac, right? And there's a lot of interesting stories that happen with Isaac, including one where Abraham takes him on a mountain and is going to sacrifice him. And Isaac's like, Dad, where's the, where's the sacrifice? Right? There was that awkward moment, like, oh, son, you're here. You're here. But this promise is not based on bloodlines. Did you know that? This promise, yes, 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 God's going to take Abram, and, and, and the entire Jewish nation is going to come from this. The entire, you know, Ishmael is going to, going to be blessed because of Abram as well, and he's going to develop into my name. Yes, there is bloodlines attached to it, but this promise that God gives to Abraham in this moment is not about bloodlines. The lineage of Abraham is based on faith. Because 
Because the same God that took this faith of Abraham and counted it to that as righteousness can do the same thing with you and I. It's not based on bloodlines. It's based, it's based on faith. And it's faith that is in the work of God and what God has told you. It's in the promises of God. See, Scripture teaches us that God has a purpose for each and every one of us. It teaches us that, that there's a place at God's table for each and every one of us. But that's not based on bloodlines. It's based on us having faith in Jesus. Because Jesus, remember what John read for us earlier, Remember, the Pharisees are questioning Jesus, and they're talking to him, and they're discovering that Jesus is saying that he's greater than Abraham. And what does Jesus say to him? He said, before Abraham, I was. That was Jesus declaring he was God, by the way, in case you missed it. Before Abraham, I was. And that is the God who stepped into humanity, went and died on the cross for us, the forgiveness of our sins. Because it's this basic, this, all, this complete trust in God, this, this taking God at His word and building our life upon it, that's the way God designed us in the very beginning. I'm not talking about Genesis, I'm talking about what? Genesis 1 and 2. That's how God designed us. We were designed and, and, and created to, to live our life in complete trust and obedience with God. It was sin that disrupted that. It was sin that caused us to distrust God and, and hide ourselves from Him. It's sin in our lives that, that makes us fear God and makes us not want to confess our fears and failures to Him. Because how could a holy, pure God like that love somebody like me? But God's promise is, God's promise is that through Jesus, that relationship can be restored. You can completely trust God with everything in your life. You can, you can confess your deepest fears. You can confess every one of your failures. And God, through Jesus Christ, has pardoned you from that sin and the guilt associated with it. He has declared you righteous in his presence, not by your own works, but by the work of Jesus. And for you to get that righteousness, all you have to do is believe. Now, when I say that word believe, it's not so simple as I believe in Jesus, right? I can go outside and believe, I can say, I, I believe I can fly. And then run and try and jump off the building, but it's not going to work out. I guess if I jump the right way, I can fly in a helicopter. But it's not the point. No. Remember I said that word believe, what it means? Abraham believed God. It means he believed God. He, he, he was willing to build his entire life, his entire existence upon that belief in God. Everything that he did, everything that he said, everywhere he went was based on that faith in God. And if you and I say we believe in Jesus, that means everything that we are, everything that we do, everywhere we go, everything we say is based upon our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. And when we get down, like Abraham, the fears of life begin to cloud our judgment. Remember what God did for Abraham? He took him outside and said, look at the stars. Count them. I, 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 you know, this is in the text, but I often wonder how many times after that moment, Abram, when the fear's found him again, because it's based on anxiety, sometimes they go away, sometimes they come back. But I wonder how many late nights he would walk out of his tent and he would just look up. In his most broken moments, he would look up at the stars and he'd say, Oh God, oh, that promise. That's all I have. Is that promise that gave him hope? Is that promise that kept him going? 
But you see, you and I, because we are descendants of Abraham through faith, because we belong to that well, and you realize that promise belongs to you and I too, in those moments where we feel our most alone, God is telling us all you have to do is go outside, look at the stars, and count them. Because that promise I made to Abraham, I made to you too. Those stars are to remind you that there are people of faith scattered all across this globe, across all the nations, across all the language barriers. There is somebody in this world that is going through the same thing you are, and you are not alone. Not just because they're with you, but because it's you. Because I am your God and with you. You may think you've messed up and ruined your life. And God said, look up and count the stars. Because your story's not done yet. Faith in Jesus is what saves us. Faith in Jesus is what justifies us. You see, faith is found in the stars, not the dust. Yes, you see, remember, Jesus died. He was buried in the tomb. He was supposed to become dust. But then he came back to life again and he ascended into heaven. We're not serving a God that's laying dead in the tomb. We're serving a God that's in the heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Count the stars. Verse 6 tells us that Abram believed and it was credited to his righteousness. Then to jump through any hoops, didn't have to cross any bridges. He just simply believed and God credited it to him. What about you? Said about believe, it's not just simply saying, you know, saying, like, saying a pledge. It's, are you willing to stake your entire life on what God said and what God's promised you? So, this morning we're going to close with communion. And you, you, most of you know, I don't know, I do communion a little different. We do, some pastors have us ushers come up and they pass out the plates of that stuff. I don't do that. Because I believe in communion, wherever we gather and take it together, it's an invitation to God's table. And to get to God's table requires us to make a conscious decision to go there. It's like, you know, when my grandma says, hey, Jason, we're, I'm making biscuits and gravy this morning for breakfast. I'm driving 90 miles an hour from Greensburg to Kentucky, and I'm going to the end to get there. I have to get to the table. So the reason why I had you all come up down center and I had you all make that decision I want you to make that decision to come to God's table for yourself. And I, believe me, there's a place at God's table for every single person here. And I know the scripture, the scripture tells us that, that communion is that thing for, that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night he was going to be portrayed to remind them that what, what the elements represented. There was an act of faith in Jesus and what Jesus was about to do. So really, communion is for those who have faith in Jesus, those who believe in Jesus and are willing to build their life upon that belief. But John Wesley taught that communion was an invitation. You see, there's a spot at the table for everybody. And everybody's invited. You have to accept the invitation. So this morning, when you come up and take the elements, no, when you come up and take it, you're standing on Jesus. Hey, these elements that represent what you did for me, I am willing to build my entire life upon that belief. I am willing to allow that belief to dictate the things I say, to dictate my actions and reactions, to where I will go and to where I will stay. So as we take communion together, you know, that's the decision you're 